Welcome, everybody, uh, to yet another fabulous session here at the uh, AxeSafe Entertainment Safety Conference. Uh, I just want to acknowledge uh, the traditional Indigenous lands that we all live and gather on today. Although this meeting is online, we still enjoy uh, the privilege of living within Indigenous within an Indigenous territory. To highlight the importance of this acknowledgement, I would I would urge you to uh, take a look at the Land Digital website, uh, www.nativeland.ca and find out your regions, uh, uh, the names for your re regions, peoples as well. I'm joining you today from the stolen lands of the Quiquitlam and Stolo peoples. Um, so welcome to uh, Breaking Up is Hard to Do. Loved the title from the get-go. Uh, contract language about cancellation. Of course, many of you can imagine how Steve and I's conversation got wrapped around this one. Um, but uh, I'm Don Parman. I'm the Manager of Programs and Services at ActSafe. Uh, I will be your moderator for today. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. If you want them answered by Stephen or I, please put it in the question and answer boxes so that we can get to them as soon as possible. Uh, Sam Handel and I are also monitoring chat so we can uh, poke you to get into the Q&A and please don't be offended if we tell you put it in the Q&A. Uh, there's going to be a little bit of a theme here. So, uh, but we, with not, uh, I don't want to hold things up any further, so I'm just going to hand it over to Mr. Uh, Steve Edelman, uh, friend and colleague of AxSafe. And Steve, I'll let you uh, tell them what you want to about yourself because you're awesome. Cool. Um, thanks, Don. <laughs> I'm awesome there. That's what you need to know. Um, happy Saturday, everyone who doesn't have a life just like me. Um, so greetings from Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, it is warm here again today. It's just under 21 degrees Celsius. So I am, in fact, wearing shorts because that is the birthright of Arizonans. Um, what I'm going to do today is something that I resisted doing for years, literally many years. People ask me, hey, Steve, you know, do you have a template contract? Can you just kind of explain, you know, the contract provisions that you use all the time? And I had to respond, no, because if I do that, then I'm out of work. I get paid for that sort of thing, at least during normal times. Well, we're not in normal times. I think we can all agree on that. And so what I'm going to do is what I, again, have long resisted doing, which is talk you through a contract. Um, there is nothing at all special about the contract that I'm going to talk you through. In fact, that's the reason that I use it. It is a perfectly mundane independent contractor agreement. Um, it, it's actually something that I wrote for a caterer um, here in Arizona. So there is no magic to the language that I'm going to show you. Zero, none. And I say that with emphasis because that's how I talk and because I don't want you to think that this is language you need to slavishly copy or you know, pick up your phone and take screenshots of every slide. It ain't like that. This is general information for you. Really the value here is I'm gonna show you an example of something which is pretty standard and then I'm gonna deconstruct why is this here? What is it supposed to do? How well does it work? So really that's what we're gonna do here. Um, so let me add my own note about participating. Again, because it's Saturday and we're talking about something that has real potential to be boring in the hands of lesser presenters than me, of course. Um, I want this to be as useful for you as possible. So, this is going to be participatory to the extent that Zoom will permit us to do that. So if you have fun comments, and I know that you will because you do, and I really enjoy reading the chat afterwards. And, you know, Sam Hindle just taught me how to save the chat as of my presentation yesterday. So send fun, cool comments, you know, snarky asides, you know, things about my office send those in the chat. But if you actually have a question or a comment about something related to contracts, to the substance of my presentation today, 
if you have a substantive issue, put that in the Q&A because our friend Don Parman is going to be monitoring monitoring the Q&A as I go through my slides. And so at the end of each slide, I'm going to take a breath, maybe a drink of tea. And in that time, if there is a question relative to anything that I just said, Don will read your question and then I can address it. So this way, it's more of a dialogue because that's the way I would teach this particular subject matter if we were all in the same room, which I really wish we were um, because I was just looking through my photos from last year. Sorry, I'm almost done with the intro. I was just looking through my photos from last year and realized, oh my God, my second to last presentation in person last year was exactly one year ago today. And as I share my screen, this is what it looked like. This was a room, a really nice conference room in San Diego, California, and it just happened to have this wallpaper in the background. And I thought that was funny. And someone took a picture of me making that face. And little did I know that a few days later, I'd come up to Vancouver to do ActSafe 2020, and then the world shut down. So, Yes, now we're going to talk about contracts. So breaking up is hard to do. This is a Talmudic commentary about canceling contracts. Um, in the Talmud, there is a little bit of text in the middle of the page. And then all around that text on the page is the, the wisdom of sages and scholars. And they're all commenting against each other about the text that's in the middle of the page. So there may be a sentence, even just a word in the middle of the page, and then all around it are different scholars and smart people trying to interpret that word or those words. That's what we're gonna do here. So let's see if I can advance my slides. I think I may have chosen the wrong one. So let's, yep. Stop that screen share. Let's try sharing a different screen. There we go. From the beginning, please. Come on. Yes. Um, so I have an agenda. It's always good to have an agenda. It shows that one is organized, despite my long introduction. Um, I am pretty organized. So briefly, I'm going to tell you my credentials. Don already started. I'm fabulous. Um, and then we're going to talk about contracts. So you kind of know who I am. If you're spending a Saturday with me talking about contract law, yeah, I guess you probably know. So this is something nice that was written by somebody whose last name was not Edelman. It's not related to me. This was NFPA Journal um, back when the world made sense. So that's nice and I didn't write it. Um, really what we're gonna talk about here is reading. And so this is a mug that I received in 1994 back when dinosaurs crawled the earth and I was still in law school. And I was part of the national trial competition. My team from Boston College Law School made the nationals and that was cool. And I'm a big believer in swag. So keep that in mind, Don Parman. Oh, here you go, by the way. I mean it. Um, I'm a big believer in swag. And so they gave us all these mugs and we all thought that was quite fabulous until we looked at them. More accurately, I looked at it, at the one that is in this picture, which is on my bookcase over here. And I noticed something about the words. And so when I was still in law school, I learned to read in a way that I think is really useful when dealing with contracts. Contracts are hard to read. We know they're hard to read. Many lawyers intentionally make them hard to read by including words that no one has ever said in the history of time. Wherefore, hereunto, thereinafter, all these other multi-part polysyllabic words that don't make a whole lot of sense and are certainly not necessary. I assure you that all of that legalese is not necessary. A contract can be perfectly enforceable with no legalese whatsoever. And so the exercise that I'm showing you on this slide is reading. 
reading is good, the words on a page, the plain language can itself be your friend if you know what those words mean. That's why we're going to deconstruct a contract. Um, Last, if you saw my talk yesterday, you know that I've been a COVID compliance guy. So this is just another facet of my fascinating life. Now, Talmudic commentary. Yes, this is a page from a Talmud, and that really is what it looks like. So if you can read Hebrew, fantastic. If not, this is more or less what we're going to do. Starting with the document name. We'll get to the cancellation stuff, we will, but I want you to kind of get the warm-up exercise, get used to taking words seriously, because that's all there is in a contract. No pictures except on this one slide, and it's because I encourage clients to have a small picture, their logo. Everybody's got a logo for something, Mine happens to look like the Roman Colosseum. And if you look carefully, you'll see an A in the middle because my last name is Edelman. And I think that's fun and subtle. I don't throw it in somebody's face, but if they look carefully, they'll say, hmm, that's clever. This particular client of mine, their name is M Culinary. Told you it's an independent contractor agreement about a catering agreement. Yeah, nothing special about that. I don't know if any of you deal with caterers. I guess you probably do. No magic here at all. So the document name. Why start by talking about a document name? Because so many contracts are obtusely named. I don't know why. So in this case, I told you that M Culinary is a caterer. So why not call this document a catering services agreement? Because if this contract got signed, then it would be for catering services. That seems pretty obvious. I assure you, many contracts that cross my desk are not named as simply as this. So Don, this is an example of me taking a breath. I'm gathering no questions in the Q&A. Didn't expect any at this point. There's only one, but I'm leaving it because I'm pretty sure you're going to address it here shortly. Oh, so Don is being soothsayer here. Let's see if I validate his hopes and dreams. Uh, So next, introductory material. This is where you introduce the parties. I think of contracts in lots of different ways, and you'll see that in just a moment. Um, In this sense, you know, at the very beginning where there's the title and then we introduce the parties, I think of it like speed dating. I've never actually done speed dating, uh, but what I imagine is that you need to introduce yourself quickly and get right to it because of the speed part. And so that's the way a contract should be written. Introduce yourself, say hi, say how somebody can find you if they like you. That's also part of speed dating, I would guess. That way you get a second date. So when I have a contract, I start right in the beginning by identifying the parties, where they're located, how you can find them. And then then I tease how the contract is going to work. And you're gonna find this delightful, but I'm gonna make you wait for just a moment. So the second paragraph on this slide is, this agreement documents the terms by which M Culinary will provide the catering services set forth in exhibit A, the services. Now, here's the fun thing about that phrase. That tells you that the catering services are gonna be in an exhibit, exhibit A. They're important because they're not in exhibit G, they're first, but they're not going to be in the main contract document itself. That is going to be a very important issue for you because it's going to make the contract simple. And simple contracts are contracts for which you do not need to call a lawyer every time you want to use it or change it because you don't want to. Now, I know how fond you all are of me and how much you would like to pick up the phone or get me on a video conference every time you have a question or just feel like chatting or having a laugh. I know that's true. Thanks. I appreciate it. My fragile ego really needs the stroking. However, for other lawyers who are less personable than me, you don't want to do that. It's costly and time consuming and keeps you from doing the work that you do. 
So what you want to do here is what I call the legal mullet. And I, I choose these names because I want them to be memorable because they're important. So I, I like jokey things because that's kind of how I roll, but the legal mullet actually is a very important idea. It's all the business parts of a contract at the beginning and all the party, basically what you do at the back. So legally operational language, that's the boring stuff that lawyers deal with every day. I know that the three elements of a contract are offer, acceptance of that offer, and some consideration, which in our context is always going to be payment. I know that. I went to law school for three years. You probably didn't and don't want to. It's expensive, more expensive now than you know eons ago than when I went. And it takes you out of the workforce for three years, which you also don't want to do. And frankly, a lot of lawyers are not such nice people. I am, but they're not. So you don't want to have to do that yourself. You want to stay in the arts and humanities where people are nice and fun things happen, at least when there's not a pandemic. So the legal mullet front loads all the legally operational stuff and makes it so that you don't have to change it. Then exhibit A has all of the event operational specific parts. Describe the event. What's it cost? When does it happen? Where does it happen if you have multiple locations? All of the parts that you do that revolve around your expertise, those are in exhibit A. Those change every time for every show, every event. That's what should change because you don't need a lawyer to change those things. Those are just operational facts. The parts that you need me or one of my brethren in the law to deal with, you don't want to change that and you shouldn't have to. So what we're going to do here is focus on the business side, the front of the legal mullet, and then in you know what will seem like a dismissively short time, I'm going to say, right, here's exhibit A. But I can't show you an exhibit A that makes any sense because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what exhibit A I would show you. For this contract, it would revolve around catering. And you don't care about M. Culinary's catering agreement from whenever I wrote this, November, I think. Um, you don't care about that. You will fill in your own operational details. We're going to focus on the contract language that at least in this example, works well enough to discuss. So that's the concept. Don, did I validate your expectations yet or should I move along? Go ahead, Steve. All right, proceeding smartly forward. So contract price, um, it's very important to identify what are you charging? But again, I don't want you to have to go into a contract every single time you're going to use it in order to change some detail. Just reference the contract price in your Exhibit A with all of the other operational facts that will change every time. Again, the idea is your contract will be, you know, sort of this, this inert object, you know, my, my act safe, you know, hydro flask. It's not going to change it's pretty impervious to anything. So this is the contract. And then the contents inside, in this case, some ice water, that will change each time. I can spill out the water, I can put in hot tea, because this is a really nice hydro flask and deals well with heat and cold. That's how the contract should work. So do I have the contract price, the actual number of dollars for a given job here? No, no, I just say where somebody can find it. Let's see if we can keep doing this, if we can keep having provisions that make sense, but don't have to change job by job. So in this case, I recommended that my client get a retainer. You know what a retainer is, it's money upon signature. Lawyers are supposed to get retainers also. I confess that I'm terrible about that. It is one of the few instances where I don't practice what I preach. I 
cling tenaciously to the idea that the law is a learned profession among gentlemen and women. And, you know, if somebody hires me, they intend to and will actually pay me for my services. Uh, you know, generally that works out, although not on my preferred schedule much of the time. But you shouldn't do that because you're not wearing wearing wigs and black robes and, you know, dealing with fancy legalese. You're doing other stuff. So as soon as you start performing work, you should be working off of a retainer if you can negotiate that. And it's just for the simple reason it's good to get paid. So I personally am a big advocate of getting a retainer, money upon signature. And that's because as soon as a contract is signed, you're gonna start doing something, whether it's starting work yourself or lining up people to do work when you know the job gets closer, or at least reserving a date and keeping other people from booking that same date, you're making some commitment that has economic value. And that's why you should get a retainer. So there's that. And I feel pretty strongly about that. Again, notwithstanding that in this case, I'm a bit of a hypocrite, but there's a reason. Um, Balance due. Well, if you're getting a retainer, that means that there is a balance due. And in a theme that you'll see again when we start talking about cancellation, there should be a payment schedule. Time passes and therefore the obligation to receive payment advances with time as well because you're going to work different amounts at different times. So here I just set up a payment schedule. And my client became entitled to receive, you know, however many dollars, it actually was a percentage of whatever was the total job price at various time intervals. Yeah, no magic to this. And you will detect a theme because I'm a bit like a broken record where I will keep saying there's no magic to this. There's nothing fabulous about this contract. It's perfectly ordinary. You may find that tiresome until you realize it's because contracts should be simple like this. That's what constitutes a good contract, one that you can use. If there were magic to it, that would be a barrier to you, you know, a lay person actually reading a contract and understanding what it says. And if you need a lawyer to read your contract and tell you what it says, that's a bad contract. And I don't want you to be trafficking in bad contracts. So everything that's here should seem simple. It was a lot of work to make it simple, I assure you, but it should seem simple and that way you can use it. So passage of time means more work has been done, therefore greater entitlement to more payment. I think that makes perfect sense. And nobody's ever pushed back on that because it makes perfect sense to most people. Change orders, same thing. We know what the scope of work is upon signature. How do we know? Because it's described in your exhibit A. That's where you say what you're gonna do, when you're gonna do it, for how many dollars, and you know what's involved. But we know that things change. And you know that's one of the things that keeps us all employed is we have to roll with the punches and that's good. It's good. You know, we improve shows and events by changing things as we learn more about the specifics of each show. That's good. However, sometimes a change is material and requires more money or just more time or more workers or something. And any material change should be documented in a change order. Now, what's a change order? Give me any damn thing you want. A change order does not, oh, here we go again, isn't magic. It doesn't have to be a document, piece of paper that says at the top, change order. It doesn't. It can be an email. I use email a lot for things like this. And really, you just want to document it somehow. Personally, I'm not a big fan of putting change orders into text messages because text messages don't have description lines and emails do. 
And I just think it's easier to keep track of things if you can title them correctly. I've already said that about how you name a contract. So in this case, if it were me, and I'm not giving you advice here because you have to pay for that, um, but if it were me, I would simply send an email documenting a material change. And in the description line, I would call it something like, oh, change order. I would probably use words like that because that's pretty descriptive. And then, hey, guess what I would put in the body of the email? What the change order is and, and what it means. Exactly. I mean, Don's throwing up his hands because it's obvious. Yes, you too can play this game and you should. There, oh, I'm not going to say it again. You know how much magic there is to all of this. So change orders, it can be an email. It can be a scrap of paper, but that's not a very good idea because that gets lost. So use whatever means is consistent with the means of communication that you use for whatever job it is that you're doing. Um, my world lives on email and I send text messages to friends uh, because if I lose one or delete it, yeah, you know, we're still friends. It's okay. Um, email is much more for business things. Um, my office is paperless, which should give you a clue that a contract does not require a piece of paper. Um, I do have a few scraps of paper on my desk. They're just you know, mail that people sent me that I recycle and, you know, tear up into quarters and use it for scrap paper. Frankly, I don't usually use scrap paper either. I have one pen. That's all I own. So do you need a piece of paper for your contract? No. Do you need a piece of paper for your change order? No, you don't. Um, electronic communication is just fine. Welcome to the 21st century. Um, all right, here we go. Um, cancellation. This is this is the topic that people have gotten all exorcised about during the pandemic for good reason. I'm gonna take a drink of tea so I can make sure that I have full throat for this conversation. Don, you wanna pose a question? There is a question now that I think uh, could fall in here. Um, uh, digitally signed contracts, are they acknowledged in the courts? Yes. So thank you for that very good question um, because I neglected to say, well, I, I gave you the three elements of a contract um, earlier in this talk. They are offer, acceptance, and consideration. Those are the three elements of a contract under common law. Common law is the law derived from England. So it's the law in BC. It's the law here in Arizona where I'm sitting right now. It's the law in the Western world that comes from the United Kingdom. So thanks to the good folks in the UK, we have only three elements to pay attention to. Offer, acceptance, and consideration. Now, your good question was um, electronic signatures. Well, let's see. Uh, offer, no, it doesn't say anything about electronic versus paper. Acceptance, mm, no, still not hearing anything about parchment, um, wood products, uh, ink, none of that. Um, consideration, well, my contracts professor, the late and beloved Sanford N. Katz, um, Professor Katz taught us that a con that consideration could even be a peppercorn. I guess that was a thing back when he went to law school. So Professor Katz taught us that a contract could be written on a basketball. Um, it could be written on a napkin, on his pocket square, which he flourished at that moment. He was a stylish guy. Um, Nowadays, you're familiar with DocuSign. Um, that is perfectly valid and acceptable in courts of law. Um, I, you know, if any of you have ever hired me, you'll see that my engagement letter just has my signature in a different font. Um, it's a signature type font. It looks like script and still says Stephen A. Edelman, um, just like the line immediately below it, which is in Times New Roman. So I literally have my name twice, but the first time is in a different font at a different size than the second time. Valid? Yes. So there is absolutely nothing sacred anymore 
about what is legally referred to as a wet signature. That's a handwritten signature with pen and ink. That's why it's called a wet signature. Um, there's nothing sacred about a wet signature anymore. Um, footnote to that, I don't know if in BC you still use notaries, a notary public is the official name. Um, that too is sort of an old timey thing. You know, we, we needed notaries public to notarize things. Literally, they would stamp a document and it would be slightly embossed and you see the raised ridges in their stamp. Um, people don't use those, at least around here anymore either. Yeah, they, they are still required in certain things here in BC uh, to have the notary do certain things. There was a, a quick follow-up to that, Stevie, if you've got the time for it now. Sure. Uh, does an email acceptance of a contract count? Yeah, well, let's work that through together. Why wouldn't it? So, you know, let's, let's go back through the three elements of a contract one more time. Offer. Well, what's the offer? The offer is to hire you to do whatever work, or if you're the hirer, to hire someone else to do a certain piece of work. Acceptance. So long as the offer was legal in BC, then acceptance is any indication of acceptance. Now, here's a fun fact. This is a you know, bit of a deep dive into contract law. Acceptance need not be signed in any form at all, not even electronically. Um, you can accept an offer by beginning to perform the work that was offered for payment. So, you know, there have been times when somebody said, Steve, I need you to work on something right now. And I say, okay. And they say, well, you know, we'll, we'll pay you, you know, whatever. And it's like, great. Um, you know, send me whatever you have and I'll start on it right now and we'll figure out the paperwork later. That's for clients I trust. Um, I accept not only by saying, okay, but by starting work and we work out the paper later. And it's not paper with me anyway, it's just something electronic. So there are lots of ways to show acceptance of an agreement. The contract is the agreement itself, and it doesn't matter in what form the agreement appears. Okay, so to, uh, a little nuance inside that. There was a question here about, um, uh, as things tend to happen very quickly in our industry, uh, those change orders or those changes to the contract agreement happen very, very quickly and on the fly. Um, uh, how do you deal with that? Uh, quickly. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, I don't know. Is there a different answer? <laughs> Maybe I'm missing the thrust of the question. Uh, it, it, there's, there's things that are sometimes uh, to be determined in the contract that happen live on site that you may not have completely uh, walked all the way through, or there may be some quite a big, big change to the site or the contract or the, the, the event that is not included in there. How do you deal with that if you don't have a, because a, a change order process from, you know, what most of us perceive as the process, I should say, uh, seems quite uh, onerous or it, it, there's certain steps. How do you deal with that in the real world in real time? Yeah. So in, in my world, a change order is not onerous. It's just memorializing some material change and whatever is the change in compensation that accompanies the change in work, you know, either services or goods provided. Um, so, you know, my, my snarky answer quickly is because in my world, a change order isn't onerous. It's something that's really fast and simply documents an oral request, which is orally agreed to. You know, hey, Don, can you bring 10 more road cases? Yes. Don then just does it. After the fact, Don will probably send an email saying, hey, in response to your request to bring 10 more road cases, I brought 10 more road cases on, you know, February 27, 2021. The cost of those 10 more road cases is whatever it is. Copy that. Um, all right. Cancellation. So remember the title of this talk is Breaking Up is Hard to Do. It's because cancellation wound up being problematic with COVID-19. Um, you know, here's a walk down the unpleasant memory lane. When the world shut down 51 weeks ago, um, everybody had contracts to work that suddenly were in breach. 
Well, the legal issue is, was that actually a breach or was that a cancellation or did COVID-19 constitute a force majeure event? Now, the nice thing about talking to Canadians is I can assume at least a slight passing familiarity with French. And so I don't have to teach you all about force majeure. It simply means higher force. Um, yes, that's actually what it means. Uh, what we Americans generally refer to mistakenly as an act of God. Um, as a Jewish guy, I never really understood that because my God isn't necessarily the same as yours or, you know, or yours or yours. So act of God is not a very descriptive term, certainly not for legally enforceable purposes. Um, so when the world shut down, basically it became a forum for argument argument among people who wanted to have their contracts enforced in the sense that they wanted to get paid. And for people who did not want to enforce the contracts because they couldn't possibly use the services for which payment was entitled. And argument by lawyers about whether that constituted a breach of contract entitling the non-breaching party to damages or whether COVID-19 constituted a force majeure event, which means the entire contract was just dissolved and the parties go to their separate corners as if they never met. Oh, and by the way, was there insurance for all of this mayhem? So let's unravel some of that contractually, and then we can talk about the insurance ramifications as well. So th this is kind of a medium to talk about other stuff too. So first let's just go through contract language. So every contract should have some cancellation provision. And the reason you want a cancellation provision should be obvious by now, but it's because stuff happens. And it doesn't necessarily mean that anyone has done the other party wrong. Circumstances change. I'm offering you two varieties of cancellation language. And I'll tell you the story of each because I think it's illustrative of the point of each contract. By the way, the 3.0 here, it's just what was in that catering contract. So there's no significance to that at all. Um, so in this version of cancellation language, this came to me from a client in Texas and when he hired me, he was telling me how, quite frankly, how fabulous he was um, and how he had worked some really big events. He was um, an event planner and he had worked some high profile names and, and prominent people and stuff like that. And I was duly impressed. And, you know, there is the term, the derisive term by people who don't live in Texas that Texans who are very boastful but can't really bring it are all hat, no cattle. Um, I think that's fun. And unfortunately, it applied to this guy. Because as it turns out, he didn't have any more of those big high profile events. He just had the feeling that he should be treated that way and that his contract should treat him like he was a really big deal. So the contract cancellation language that I wrote for this guy, this you know, self-proclaimed big deal, was pretty draconian. Basically, if anyone had the audacity to cancel his contract, no matter when, no matter why, he was entitled to full payment within 10 days. That was the language that he wanted. And, you know, I'm a mercenary. I wrote it for him. I said, it's not very nice. Um, not really a good way of getting repeat business. And he insisted that he was a big deal and that was not going to be a problem because no one ever was, you know, so foolish as to cancel on him. Uh, you know, kind of all hat, no cattle. Then he wound up being one of my slow paying clients because yeah, he didn't have any more work for a while. And I'm probably making more fun of him than I should. I feel badly that he didn't actually have much business at that point. But my point to you is 
he was very aggressive with his cancellation language. And I don't think that's a really good way of doing business. And remember I said that a contract is kind of like speed dating. Well, there's a lot to that dating analogy. And I don't want to overplay this. I don't want you to you know, have your brain wander off into thoughts of past spouses or anything. But the idea here is the contract itself, the document that we're working through, is one of the early stages of a relationship. And you can either start that relationship from a basis of trust and treating each other with fairness and even, dare I say it, kindness. Wow, a lawyer talking about kindness and fairness. Holy cow, it must be Saturday. Um, I think contracts should start from that basis because that tends to create the kind of relationship that will help you ride out conflict. Now, let me contextualize that comment so you know why I might talk about kindness and fairness, and then I'll get to the other half of this cancellation language, what I frankly think is a better way of doing it. Oh, crap. Too long a wind-up. I forgot what I was going to say. Ah, I missed it. I just, I can't remember the point I was going to make. All right, so let's just go on. That happens. Um, so this is reality. People make mistakes all the time. I said that. Um, so the other version of contract language that I think is better is this. And if you've ever dealt with a hotel contract, this will look pretty familiar. It's basically just dates on a calendar. It's how many days back from an event is the cancellation. And the idea, as I said to you about retainers and then receiving the balance due, is the closer you get to event day, the more work you're likely to have put in. Conversely, when canceling, you simply turn that equation upside down. The farther away from the event you are, the smaller your damages are, the less out of pocket you are. And so when it's just after the contract signing, you know, if it's more than 60 days before the scheduled event, in this case, my catering client, they hadn't done anything yet, hadn't ordered food, they hadn't hired servers, had done nothing. So at that point, they just kept the retainer. And that seemed fair enough. And then, you know, we just kind of graduated it. So Don, let me pause here. What, yeah. What's the question? There, there's a, a very fitting question that just came up from Sandy. Uh, if a contract isn't canceled, but just postponed to some undetermined date, which I'm sure we're, we're, we're probably going to cover that too. How oh, do you yeah. cover the undetermined dates, which is another question that's come up. But um, if it's been postponed to some undetermined date, is that still a contract cancellation that requires some sort of financial compensation? So this gives me occasion to, for a third time, go through the elements of a contract. So now we're gonna apply the elements, offer, acceptance, and consideration to the circumstance of you have an agreement, you even put signatures on it somehow or another, and now you've got to postpone. So you're not canceling, you still wanna to work together, but basically you want to change the contract by changing the date. Really a postponement is a change order certainly a material term, changing the date, because changing the date may well change other things like the availability of supplies or the availability of a site or you know, just the overall cost due to, I don't know, inflation or something. So a postponement is a change. It is a new contract. Now, a new contract can have all the same terms as the old contract, it simply requires some new consideration. This requires me to define what consideration actually means. I told you it can be anything, including a peppercorn. Consideration is some right to something. That's all it is. It is as general as that silly series of words sounds. So, Let's now apply that to postponement. 
So you had an agreement, you were going to put on a show, you know, March 15, 2020. And because everything shut down on, you know, March 10, 2020, the show did not go on. Well, you actually want to host the show. The vendor wants to, you know, supply whatever it is they're going to supply. Great. So you didn't cancel the contract. You simply put it off until it was possible to do so, legal to do so. You need to somehow create a new contract. Well, the offer is going to be, we'll host the show. The acceptance is, yes, I want to supply services for the show. The consideration is you will hold the new date, the date on which you, until which you have postponed, you know, June 2021. And the consideration on their end is they will take the same price to provide the same services that you agreed would be sufficient as of March 2020. The consideration is whatever is your new agreement and foregoing the opportunity to do something different with someone else on that date instead. So consideration can be payment or it can be foregoing the opportunity to do something else. Those are both perfectly valid consideration to support a contract. Don? Okay. I'm going to try to wrap three questions into one uh, thing. So the writing agreements or renegotiating an agreement or a change order, uh, as it may be, when you don't know what's going to play out, we don't know whether we're going to be at 50 full capacity. Um, we don't. We may not know what the new date is, um, and and the the second part to that was: is it wise or is there ability to put postponement language into the original contract? No, um, it, it's not because, well, for the reason that you just said, postponement is by its nature indefinite and uncertain. So you don't have to have a postponement provision. Postpone it to something that you can simply agree to. You know, you, if we could ever walk up to each other on the street, you could walk up to somebody on the street and say, hey, we agreed to meet for lunch tomorrow, but I can't do it. So do you mind postponing? Hey, let's, you know, let's try next week. And the other person says, yeah, next week is pretty good for me. Um, you know, later this week, let's exchange calendars and we'll figure out a day. That is a perfectly suitable postponement. It's an agreement to agree. Is that enforceable per se? No, it's not, because there's nothing definite there. It's a statement of intentions. And back to why it's good to be kind and fair, a statement of intentions isn't enforceable, but you both want to do business. We all want to do business. You know, Whether you're on the house side or the vendor side or whatever side of the equation you're on, we all want to get back to work in our industry. So agreements to agree in the future, they're not binding, but they're sure important. That's the currency we're dealing with right now. Don, was, was there a follow-up part that we didn't get to yet? Uh, so I think that addresses if there's no new date, that is just uh, you're, you're suspending the renegotiation essentially or the, or the change order until a, a new date is agreed. Is that, does that summarize that? Yeah, um, because yeah. the date of the contract will pass, you know, probably passed last spring sometime. So all that you can agree to even right now, February 27, all you can agree to right now is when we're allowed to reopen and when it's safe to reopen, which may be two different things, then we want to get back together and do whatever agreement we were gonna do. But that's all you can agree to right now. That is really interesting information. Uh, so I think we just answered two of the questions. Uh, Galen, I hope that answered your question as well, because that's that indefinite. We don't know what, what it's going to be. So interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, let's, I'm a big believer in context. So it's very easy to get lost in the weeds of contract language. It's boring. It's you know, kind of hard, especially if you're not a big reader. And I say that respectfully. Um, that's why relationships are really important. You know, we're a relationship based industry. You know, I, I am blessed by many smart friends. 
and you are too. And especially now, if you are basically a fair and kind person, things are working out or will work out shortly better for you than someone who was a hard ass, you know, the all hat, no cattle Texan that I mentioned. Uh, things are going to be tougher for him because he seemed like a decent enough guy, but he wasn't likable, especially. I respected him, but I didn't like him very much. And contracts are only as enforceable as you're willing to, you know, go to the mat, go to court. You don't want to do that. So, I mean, let's, while I have this cancellation language on the screen, let's talk about what a contract can do and what it cannot do. So this is sort of contract philosophy 101 here. You don't need a contract. You don't need a written document. Contract, again, is just the offer which is accepted and supported by some consideration. You do need a contract. You don't need a written document. You don't. You know, you can write a contract on a basketball or nowhere at all. It can just be oral. Oral contracts are perfectly binding. The reason we write contracts, whether on paper or electronically, is because people forget stuff or they have different meanings of things or, you know, time passes and the original signing principles leave and, you know, then other people have to try to enforce the agreement. Written things remember better than memories do. That's why we write this stuff down. There's nothing about a written or electronically memorialized document that is necessary to an enforceable contract. But even with a contract in your hand, that doesn't mean that you are ready to enforce it. Contracts, just like every other law, are not self-enforcing. So you can be holding a contract in your hand, looking at the person who you contracted with, and they can still say, I don't care. I'm not interested in paying you what I contractually agreed to any longer. Sue me. And that can happen. And at that point, you have a decision to make, which is, am I going to get bulldozed into making a new deal, a change order, or are you going to say, you're a terrible person, I'm going to court? And you can do that. But you should know that going to court is expensive and time consuming. And judges don't always see things the way you would like. And juries often don't see things the way that you would like. And so the reason why I'm emphasizing simple language and showing you these very simple words and emphasizing that there's no magic to any of this is because contracts aren't self-enforcing. You don't want to have to go to court. You want to be able to wave this in front of somebody and say, look, you agreed to something that's really simple. Let's just do what we agreed to. If they're a jerk or a terrible person and they say, no, I don't care, you may have to go to court, but that's unpleasant, time consuming and expensive. And it's what you want to avoid. It's what we want to avoid, even as you know, lawyers get paid to slug things out like that. Going to court is unpleasant for us too. I'm much happier sitting in my office wearing shorts like I am right now, you know, tapping out contract language for clients. That is a pretty stress-free existence for me. And it's better for you as well. So if it seems like I'm, I'm overemphasizing simplicity, that's the end game. Enforcing contracts is easier if you've developed a relationship and if everybody understands what the terms of that relationship are because you use simple language and you put all the moving parts, the party, in the back. So just a quick question for you, Steve. How are you doing for time? Because uh, there are a few more questions that are starting to bubble in here. Yeah, I'm good because the second half of this talk, I just zip through. Oh, all right. So uh, really quickly, uh, it, the, one of the questions that came from Alana was, uh, is it better to po postpone indefinitely than to postpone to a future date? Which I think that in itself, that I, I'm already sensing that that's the wrong wording. 
Postponing to a future date is one term, and rescheduling to a specific date in the future, two different things. Um, hoping that, or postponing to a future date, hoping that the conditions would would improve. Wh which would which would you recommend? Yeah, um, given the world that we are living in right now, I don't think you can pick a new date with a great deal of certainty. Um, now, I know, because I can read, that some big event producers are doing exactly what I just said is hard, which is they're picking a specific date. If you do that far enough out, you're probably pretty safe. Um, you know, I'm vice president of the Event Safety Alliance. We are lucky that our big annual event, the Event Safety Summit, takes place in either late November or early December every year. So I just started a conversation yesterday about our 2021 Event Safety Summit. Because it's gonna be in either late November or early December, we're pretty confident that we can do it in person. We'll still have a virtual component because we know the world will be imperfect at that point. Really what we're hoping is that we're just so incredibly busy that people can't spend the time you know, schlepping out to Pennsylvania. And, you know, we don't want people to take off from work because we'll be so happy to have work. But we're lucky because we're talking about November or December. If your event, if your season, you know, starts in May, you're on the cusp. You know, we don't know what May is going to look like. I think April is going to look a lot like right now. May is probably a turning point. Maybe it's June instead of May. Probably not as far out as July or August. At least that's what we're hearing in the states. And you know, vaccine is going to vaccination is going to pick up a lot. So you know, you're basically just throwing a dart at a dartboard and hoping that whatever date you pick is going to be a contractual obligation that you can fulfill. I don't know that we're there yet. Sure. Okay, I think that answers that one. Uh, the other one, and this is a bit, there's a two-part question, but I think part one will negate the second question. <laughs> COVID, can COVID be considered force majeure? Okay, so I don't remember if I have force majeure language in this contract. Um, you know, I should check. So I'm just gonna zip through right now. Don't look, because this is like total spoiler alert. Um, weather insurance, Nope. So this particular client did not have, there we go, um, did not have force majeure language. And that was perfectly fine with me. And the reason for that, so I need to explain what force majeure is and how it works, but I can do that here. You know what? I'll just talk to you and then I'll bring my slide deck back up. Let's see if I can find my cursor again. There we go. Stop sharing. Okay, so now I can look you in the eye. So force majeure, it means higher force. Again, what we Americans refer to as act of God. A force majeure provision is comprised of two elements. It is a thing which is completely unexpected, if not unprecedented, which too renders performance either impossible or impracticable. Now, we know that COVID-19 is something that no contract anticipated, none of us imagined until it happened. So the first of the two prongs is easy. Something that nobody, neither party expected is not either of their fault, which renders performance either impossible or impracticable. So impossible is also fairly straightforward. Your building burns down. You cannot host a show. Um, you know, someone gets hit by a bus. They cannot perform. That's easy. That's impossible. Lawyers don't argue about either the first prong or the second, the, the first part of the second prong. Unfortunately, that's never where the action is either. So really where lawyers make their money with regard to force majeure provisions is the second prong. So the second prong, just to start from the beginning, is Something has happened, which is not either party's fault, which renders performance of the contract either impossible, done with that, 
or impracticable. Impracticable is a real word. You can look it up. And what it means is something can be done, but it can't be done in a way that makes sense under the circumstances. So you could host your show even in the smoking ruins of your building because you don't require lighting or sound equipment, but you'll get really wet and as a result, no one will come. You could theoretically compel performance by, I don't know, the cleanup crew, you know, the sanitation vendor. You could compel performance because there's still a binding contract, but it would be dumb to do so because performance under those circumstances would be so radically different in a smoking ruin of a building. Impracticability does not have any limits. And any word that has no limits is fodder for lawyers to just bill as many hours as we can come up with reasons to bill. And that's part of what I refer to as the Lawyer's Full Employment Act. Yay for us lawyers, boo for clients. Force majeure provisions don't work very well in the context of COVID-19 because you could still put on some kind of event until the local you know, provincial authorities said you couldn't. And at that point, illegality of the event becomes a reason that performance becomes impossible. All right, now maybe you do actually have a force majeure event. Well, what happens in the context of force majeure? So let's say that performance became illegal and that your force majeure provision included illegality as a reason which was not either party's fault, which renders performance impossible. That would be a legitimate use of force majeure language. So what result? Well, force majeure simply unwinds the contract. This is the theory. It unwinds the contract and then both parties go back to their corners as if they never met. Well, how's that work? How, how does that work if either party has started to act in reliance on the contract? So I had this a lot because I represent a lot of companies that that tour. You know, they provide services in lots of different places. So they expended resources to get all lined up and they were ready to, you know, unload cases and trucks and start doing wonderful things. And then they were stuck in whatever place they were in. And they had a whole bunch of stuff that was rotting in coolers and people who were all in the wrong places who had to get home and no one was paying them to do that. And who pays for all that? Yeah, force majeure doesn't have an answer to those questions. It just, you know, the, the principle of force majeure is simply a higher force has intruded upon the ability of either party to enforce the contract. And so we just unwind it. But unwinding a contract where the burden would be shared unequally is itself something that you have to negotiate. Who's going to bear the burden? And now we are once again back to Steve's principle of being nice to the other side. Because really the best result is to postpone, to say, wow, this COVID thing sucks and we all really wanted to do our thing with each other. We don't know when we're going to be able to get back together, but when we are, let's do it. That's postponement. It's agreeing to agree on a future date to do something that looks a lot like what you agreed to do before. Contractually binding? No. It's interesting. It's an agreement to agree. Yeah. So I have a specific situation. Somebody has, has thrown into the chat. You up for it? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so at this point, I've tr trashed my script. But let's just talk. Let's answer questions now. So, uh, so a performance that was sold out but had to be rescheduled, that the artist is willing to do the show, possibly, but, uh. the, but the audience is now limited to 50. Would this be force majeure? So th this comes up in the context of severe weather provisions a lot. Uh, uh, it, it is the artist 
in the context of severe weather, it comes up where the language says that the artist is entitled to payment so long as the artist is ready, willing, and able, or ready and willing to perform. Right. And my response to that when I strike that language for clients is, I don't care if some crazy artist who you know, wouldn't know a weather app if they had it on their phone. I don't care if they want to perform because they're lunatics. And you know their interest is in getting paid and then getting back on the bus to get to their next show. So anyone's readiness and willingness to perform is of no interest to me whatsoever. So now, Don, tee up your question and let's put it in the right context. So ask the question again, because I got off track. Uh, so the performance that was sold out, but it had to be rescheduled. The yeah. artist is willing to so, do the show, but now the audience is only going to be 50 people, which is under the impracticability. Uh, yeah, you know what I mean? Impracticability. Yeah. So that is a material change in the agreement, because obviously the revenue stream is going to be completely different. So you're not going to pay an artist the revenue that they should get from, I don't know, a 2000 person audience, along with the F and B and merch sales, if there are only 50 people in the house and there's no F and B and, you know, maybe you sell one t-shirt and a Fez. Um, that's obviously a very dramatic change in the contract. So to me, that would fit within either force majeure or you know, the, the basic impracticability. I, I'm pausing because I'm going to reset my answer. It fits within force majeure because the underlying concept of force majeure is frustration of purpose. That is an actual legal construct. If the purpose of a contract is going to be frustrated by external events, then the contract cannot proceed as the parties wrote it. That's the, the essence of force majeure. Wasn't my fault, wasn't your fault, but neither of us can do things as we envisioned it. So let's rip up that contract, go to our separate corners. And if we wanna do business on a, under different terms, let's write a new contract. That's what needs to happen for the artist to perform for 50 people instead of 2000 has to be a new contract because the old one is void due to frustration of purpose. And that is also a common law contract doctrine. Excellent. So I'm hoping that answered, answered Michael's question. It, it's still a little, little tricky the way he's worded it, but I, I think, I think that answered the question. So I'm going to, I'm going to remove it, Michael. And if, if you need a follow up, definitely let me know. Um, so one of the other uh, interesting uh, questions that came out of this is uh, Ace Martin says, I would think that planning shows during the pandemic with a high or likely prob probability that it may be canceled due to, due to said pandemic would also negate any attempt at claiming a force majeure. In other words, you know this is ongoing. You know that there's a high likelihood that, uh, that it could be canceled in the future. Does force majeure apply then? So... The likelihood that we're going to wind up having to postpone again doesn't change the enforceability of force majeure provisions. Force majeure provisions are hard to enforce under all circumstances because they require you to hire a lawyer and to have that lawyer have a credible threat of taking you to court, taking the other side to court. That sort of saber rattling gets expensive fast. You just don't want to go in that direction unless you have to. It is better to have language like I left up on the screen for 15 minutes, you know, the cancellation language, which is, I think, pretty transparently fair. You know, before you put in much work, all you do is keep the retainer. As you get closer to event day, you keep more of the money because you've spent more of the money. Basically, you're just recovering your out-of-pocket costs and, you know, whatever opportunity costs you forewent, had to forego, and even that during the pandemic, there is no foregone opportunities because it's not like you could have done a different show. We all got sidelined together at the same moment. So 
Yeah, force majeure is, it, it's just so sticky. It's really hard to enforce. It's hard to interpret. It's hard to enforce. It requires, you know, lawyers threatening each other and, you know, yeah. sometimes going to court. It's just a bad idea. Well, let me ask you a question here because I'm getting a, I'm kind of getting from you the way you're discussing force majeure is that it may not be used as often as we think it is in contract. Oh, no, it's not. I'm kind of pulling back the curtain. This is Steve Edelman as Penn Gillette right now. You know, I'm telling you the trick. The trick is force majeure provisions. You get used to seeing them in contracts. They don't get used very often because they're super hard to enforce. Cancellation language, objective cancellation language, you know, identify a date on the calendar, apply a percentage of the contract price. That's just math. That's what you want. You want to simply have objective criteria for things. That's what makes a contract enforceable. As right. soon as you as soon as you get into the shades of gray, which frankly I love because they're interesting, they make it really hard to reach an agreement. And all a contract is is an agreement. It's an agreement between two parties who more or less want to work together. Uh, so we got about we got about 10, 15 minutes left. Uh, did you want to go through the rest of those slides? Nah. The, I covered the cancellation stuff that I wanted to. So the uh, rest was really me whipping through some boilerplate language and saying what it means. But you don't need that. Um, if you ever do, just shoot me an email. Um, I'm sure that my my email address and my phone number will be in the show notes somewhere. And, you know, that, that'll be good enough. Okay. But, but the rest is boilerplate. Okay. So uh, the... Thank you, uh, Sam. A couple of follow-up questions then. Um, uh, one from Am and Deep that I've been holding on to for a little bit more uh, broader questions is: uh, Were you busy with uh, COVID-related breaches of contract? Yes. Um, more accurately, I was busy talking to clients about whether they had any recourse when the world shut down, and specifically whether I thought the insurance companies were right when they said COVID related business cancellation losses were not insured risks. I got asked that a lot in late March and April. And I can cover that turf very briefly if, if you think it's appropriate. Um, so the, the short version, business cancellation losses are covered under property insurance. It's just the way it's written. It's the same in the US and Canada. It's part of the ISO forms. Um, so business cancellation losses are part of property damage. Unfortunately, the way property damage insurance is written everywhere is in order to have a covered property loss, there has to be physical damage to property. Damn, so close, but COVID-19 does not physically damage property. We know that. It's transmitted by aerosolized droplets. And so a bunch of restaurants, primarily restaurants, filed suit for bad faith, you know, denial of, of insurance coverage claims. Um, and they all lost. They all lost. Every single one of them lost because it is correct when the insurance company said, uh, 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 we're not paying for these business interruption claims because the reason you had to cancel the gig had nothing to do with physical damage to your property. COVID-19 is a virus. It does not damage physical things. Wow. So there we go with uh, how much do we love the insurance industry again, right? I mean, that's, a that's a, I think that's another session for another time. Um, uh, okay, let me go back to a couple of questions we've got here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, da, 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 does okay. See, I almost want to an try answering this question myself, but there's a question here. Oh, uh, go for it, Don. I love when people play lawyer. So, so, does the anticipated audience size need to be stated in the contract? My guess, my educated guess here would be that that should actually be part of the agreement for compensation. That that language we, would be there. Right? Why? What changes with the number of people in the crowd? 
uh, the amount of money coming in. Correct. So what's the best way to ensure that you get compensated fairly based on a number that can vary? A uh, percentage or a uh, ticket sale percentage. Ladies and gentlemen in webinar land, Don Parman, lawyer for a day. Yes, that's exactly right. When there is a variable, simply assign a percentage to it. We've done that twice in this contract that I showed you before I just cast it aside in the retainer and then balance due provision, and then again in the cancellation language. When there is an indefinite term, simply assign a percentage to it, and then you are, voila, good to go. At 50, at 50 people in a crowd, though, that might change that contract language very quickly. Well, you're right. You're right. So it's not in, it, it's not a curve that proceeds indefinitely in both directions. It's within a range. Right. Of, of course. Because uh, uh, I, I know that that, con that conversation, I've heard the conversation happen between artists and presenters, and that number kind of varies uh, quite, uh, quite a bit. So uh, I'm going to throw one more question out for you at the moment. Um, is there a difference when dealing with collective agreements and a breakup? Uh, explain collective agreements in this context. I, I'm going to guess that that's when you've got a unionized workforce that is part of that agreement. Oh, oh, collective bargaining agreements. All right, so ask the question again now that I understand what we're talking uh, about. What's the difference between collective agreements when you're... The difference when dealing with collective agreements and breaking up. Um, I mean, it's like any other law because the collective bargaining agreement is going to be law that governs part of the contract, you don't have a choice. You have to follow law. So just like the provincial law in BC, if there is a CBA and that is you know, something that governs performance under the contract, you have to follow the terms of the collective bargaining agreement. You don't get to negotiate that again. It's already been collectively bargained. Okay. I hope that answers that, Morgan. Um, uh, this is a good question. I'm going to throw this one out there before we start to wrap up. But uh, uh, have any lawsuits arisen against the insurance companies about this perhaps being uh, unclaimed, not being able to claim these losses due to COVID as uh, insurance being sold in bad faith? Oh, that, that's exactly what the claim was. Um, in fact, we call it bad faith claims. Um, that is exactly what the allegation was by countless restaurants okay. and mostly restaurants, they alleged, so I'll say it now in a correct full sentence, you know, restaurant A sues its insurance company alleging that the insurance company has denied a covered claim in bad faith. That's, that is how the allegation reads. Right. And as we know, there's some, some stories that were out about, uh, I believe it was Shaw Festival, that had had pandemic coverage and uh, they exercised it and it worked well for them. And now those companies are no longer offering pandemic coverage. Well, so, yes, um, I think the British Open, um, either tennis or golf, I forget now which one, um, they had purchased pandemic insurance for many years and wow, did they score big time. Um, almost no one had bet, had, had made that bet. Um, and so they all got screwed. But for you guys, the end of that story is you can't buy pandemic insurance now. You, there's no market for it. I mean, Lloyd's of London, the Lloyd Syndicate, they'll insure anything. I mean, they'll insure a ham sandwich you can't buy pandemic insurance from the Lloyd syndicate or any place else. It's just not a, an insurable risk and probably won't be for at least the next five years. So, you know, keep those face coverings handy. This pandemic is going to have a wind down. That's going to be, you know, full of, of potholes and trap doors for all of us. And, the unavailability of insurance to cover this risk is one of them. Okay, uh, there's a couple lingering questions, one of which is about Prime Contractor that I'm a little bit afraid to open this late in, in the game. Um, <laughs> uh, back to that, uh, that the idea of electronic acceptance, um, does that apply to employment contracts as well? 
it applies to all contracts. Excellent. Okay, I think yeah. that'll, that, yeah, so it's, it's kind of the message I'm getting, it applies to one kind of, applies to all. Yeah. Uh, that's excellent. Um, one of the questions I had for you, for a lot of our groups going forward with it, the uncertainty that we have, um, I, I'm kind of from your conversation, I'm kind of getting the idea is, is postpone it with an agreement to, re, to agree again, or postpone it with, we'll revisit this at another time. Yeah, and I mean, that's what people do when they genuinely want to get back together. Here's the, here's the situation that I suspect everybody is already realizing, which is sometime this summer when, you know, we reach herd immunity wherever you're located, there's going to be a mad scramble to, to lock in dates and, and to get crew to work things. And, oh, my God, it's going to be, you know, manna from heaven. It's exactly what we all want, except it's going to be like drinking from a fire hose. And you're not going to be able to get the date that you want unless you're first in line. And you're not going to be first in line. And so you can have an agreement to agree, but you're going to have to be flexible which once more gets us to the idea that it's really important to be kind to people, to have a good relationship, because there is going to be this mad scramble. And, you know, it, it's going to be exactly what we all want, but it's going to be a little too much of it. And I will definitely take that. I will happily forego sleep and weekends and, you know, all the other trappings of normal life. I don't care. You know, being out of work for a really long time blows for me just like it does for you. So an agreement to agree, postponement to an indefinite date is the same thing that everyone else is going to do. So just bear that in mind. And, you know, to the extent that you're able to be flexible yeah. because everyone else is going to be in the exact same position happily, but we're all going to be there. Excellent. That's that's a, I think that's a really good kind of uh, uh, note to finish on. Uh, one quick question for you: uh, Will they? Will you be able to share your slide deck with the attendees at the conference? Oh, of course. Okay, great. I, I just I, I I hadn't asked you that question earlier. So uh, so somebody asked that in the chat. Yes, we will be offering it up. Uh, we'll send it to the attendees a little bit later. So those bits of language he did have in the slide deck, you'll be able to see that. Although we talked about most of it here, you'll be able to, to see it kind of in, in real time. Um, yeah, you great. can see the, the rest of the stuff that I didn't talk about. It, it, it is the least interesting stuff. That's why I felt okay, you know, not talking through it. Yeah, and, and it's great because the people who were actually asking me those questions the last six months got to ask them here, which was really awesome. And get them from you directly, which I, I'm always like, get it from the expert. Absolutely. So thank you. I don't know, Don. You did pretty well with your with your one foray into the law. There's, there's, no, there's no other reason that I've spent enough time with you that I started to channel Steve Edelman uh, <sighs> and, and start looking at this stuff. But I have learned that from you. Starting to look at it from that lens really does make a difference uh, as we go down the road. Uh, so we've got just another minute or two less. Huge thanks, Steve, for joining us again. Um, I wish we were together again so that we could chat and uh, and have a beer. And yeah, you got it. <laughs> uh, excellent. So, Yay, Axe! <laughs> uh, thanks again, Steve. And uh, uh, as we wrap up here, um, yeah, again, big applause for Steve Edelman. His information's in the chat. Um, uh, as we close out, please remember to fill out the, the, um, uh, the poll that's going to come up so we can get some valuable data from this. We will be putting Steve's resources up on the website as we get everything together. There should be a link sent to everybody uh, afterwards. Um, and I also wanted to thank our sponsor, and I have to find, do we have a sponsor for this one? Oh, we might not. I don't have it in my list. So I'm going to thank uh, ESA. I'll say ESA for letting Steve, the ESA really equips Steve to come and spend time with us. So I'm going to thank ESA for letting you, letting you join us this time. And that's pretty much it. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Thanks very much, Steve. Super fun. Great questions. Uh, always love your perspective on things. Great. Great. Be safe, everyone. Thanks a lot. <laughs>